As many of you know, we've been working our way through a sermon series focusing on the life of Elijah. And uh, today we're going to be wrapping up this series. And we're going to be focusing on uh, our attention on what, what took place in Elijah's life after this tremendous victory that we talked about last week. And so um, just uh, for a quick review, if some of you don't know about Elijah or don't know about his life, um, Elijah was a prophet uh, of God who spoke to the people of Israel. If you have your Bible with you, um, it's, it can be found in 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah kind of burst onto the scene. Um, and the, the circumstances regarding Elijah, his life, and the, and the times there in Israel, uh, which is you know, where he was at, uh, Israel had 19 consecutive evil kings, leading them away from worshiping Yahweh, who was the one true God, to worship uh, specifically the false gods of, of Baal, who was the sun god or the fire god, and kind of like his wife, the goddess Asherah, who's the goddess of fruitfulness or uh, fertility. And so Israel was led astray by the, the evil kings to, to worship these two false gods. And so what God did was like, hey, Elijah, I'm, I'm this, this, enough is enough. Uh, it's time to confront the evil that, you know, Israel was supposed to be my people. I was supposed to be their God, and they were supposed to worship me. It's time to confront them. So for over 200 years, they had been gradually falling away from God. All right, and they've been stepping away time and time again. And so God's like, hey, for the sake of my people, like I need to bring my people back into a relationship with me because as they move farther away, I mean, their hope for uh, being my children, being my people is, is diminished, is gone. And so uh, Elijah says to the king, like, the God has sent me to, to go bring judgment against you. And they were an agrarian society. They were farmers. They were nomads. They lived off the land. They were shepherds, things like that. And so they needed crops. Um, they needed rain. And said, so Elijah was like, until I pray for it to rain, it's not going to rain again. And so for three and a half years, the Bible says it didn't rain. Three and a half years, the, the people of Israel suffered because of their, their unwillingness to turn back to God. And it, hasn't, it wasn't the fact that God hadn't sent prophets and judges and people to lead them back. They, they did. They persecuted the prophets. They killed the prophets. We, we learned, uh, we, we, we learn, uh, actually we'll read it today. We, we learned about it last week as well. And so God pronounces this judgment and, and the confrontation was early on in 1 Kings chapter 17. But God didn't just continue the confrontation. He, he told Elijah, go and hide. So for three and a half years, he, first of all, he sent him to the Kareth Ravine, which was a time of testing, a, a, a time of trying. Um, we talked about the fact that in the Kareth Ravine, God needed to do something in Elijah's life so he could later on do something through Elijah. And we're, we, last week we saw what he did through Elijah. So sent to the Kareth Ravine. Um, God provided for him there miraculously. After that, he went to Zarephath to a widow, um, and uh, she was basically given up. She was like, hey, I've got just enough flour, just enough oil to make one last meal for my, myself and my son, and after that, we're going to eat this meal, and we're going to die. And Elijah was like, no, go ahead and take that, take that flour, take that oil, make me a, a loaf of bread, um, and after that, make one for yourselves. And he said, when you do that, the, the flour will never run out, and the the jar of oil will never run dry. And so God, God blessed this woman um, until one day her son passes away. And, and, and we didn't really talk about this too much, but, you know, Elijah at that point you know, prayed to God and was like, hey, God, you've, you've blessed this woman. You've used me. You've brought me into her life. Raise her son up from the dead. And so we, we see through Elijah, God was able to do the first, you know, resurrection from the dead. And so, you know, that's, that was all taking place uh, prior to the confrontation. And then last week we really talked about, you know, once God said, okay, it's time. It's been three and a half years. Israel's been suffering. People have been dying. The nation has been ravaged. People, like, it, 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 there's a boiling point. You know, they, they've been worshiping the goddess of fruitfulness and uh, fertility. And they recognize that she's not holding up her end of the bargain because false gods promise what only the true God can provide. And like uh, the, uh, Asherah hasn't been playing her part, hasn't been doing her part because she hasn't given us food for three and a half years. And now it was time to confront Baal, the primary God. 
And so we talked about the fact that there was a fire challenge. Elijah said uh, to the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, you guys build your altar, put your sacrifice on the altar, you pray and to, for your God to call down fire, to rain down fire, to consume your sacrifice, um, and I'll do the same. And then he said, whoever's God answers, that will show they're the one true God, and th the people can worship that one true God. So they did it. Uh, the, the prophets of Baal and Asherah, they spent all day, you know, they built their altar, they began to pray that the sacrifices on the altar began to pray, dance, shout, um, nothing happens. We learned that when Elijah's turn came in the evening, he simply said a prayer, God sent fire, it consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the wood on the altar, it con consumed the stones of the altar, um, the dirt around the altar, and even the water that they poured on the sacrifice to show the power and uh, faithfulness of God. And so this is where we pick up in 1 Kings 19. Like all that's taken place at the end of, at the end of the, this great victory. And Elijah said, you know, these, these 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, they have been leading you astray. They have been asking you to sacrifice your children to, to these fake gods. They've been, you know, encouraging you to do these evil act, acts and practices as worship. And, and the Jewish law stated that if someone did that, the uh, consequence was death. And so all of those false prophets were put to death uh, by the Jewish law uh, and in judgment of what God said. And so after all of that, we can pick up in 1 Kings 19. And, uh, you know, Elijah kind of sent Ahab home, and he... he uh, let, Eli, uh, let King Ahab know, hey, it's going to finally rain. God's judgment is over. You can celebrate. And, and we saw Elijah kind of uh, praying uh, for, for that and seeing God's response. And so this is, what, uh, this is where we pick up in, in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 3, we can read this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he killed all the prophets with a sword. So he, he went back home after this great victory. He didn't say, hey, Jehovah, the God that we've, our ancestors worship, he didn't go home and tell his wife this. Jehovah, the God our ancestors worship, he sent down fire and, and not only consumed the sacrifice on the altar, but it consumed everything around it. He just totally revealed himself, revealed his power, revealed his authority. Everyone knew that Yahweh was the one true God. He didn't say that. He went home to tell his wife, this evil queen Jezebel, that um, El Elijah had killed all the prophets of Asherah and Baal. Like, it didn't matter to him that they were worshiping false gods who couldn't provide what they said they could. To him, it was all about the fact that, hey, the way of, of their life, the, what, what they were comfortable with, um, was, had, had come to an end. And so in verse 2, it says, Jezebel sent a message to Elijah to, and to say this, may the gods, and I think it's interesting once, here, once again, she's, she's like, may the gods, she's still depending on She's still depending on Baal and Asherah. All right? they, they, they've proved themselves to be weak and powerless and false and fake, but she's still confident in them. May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. And what Jezebel was saying was that as far as it depended on her, Elijah was a dead man walking. Like, hey, I, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure you pay for what you did. For, for, for trying to pull Israel back into a relationship with the God who rescued them from Egypt. I, w she wants to destroy Elijah. And w if you remember, we looked at James 5, 17, and talking about Elijah's prayer life. And it said this, it said, Elijah was a human being even as we are. If you remember that. This next part of this passage once again reveals the humanity in Elijah, all right? How, how he was just like, he wasn't a super Christian. He wasn't, you know, a super prophet. He didn't have any special uh, connection with God that, that we can't have, all right? He didn't have magic powers, no, nothing. Because after God had done everything in Elijah's life, like uh, the communication with God, like, uh, you know, he, him talking to God and, and God responding, you know, God's direction, you know, pointing him where he should go, God's provision in the desert and with uh, in Zarephath. 
you know, God's answered prayers for, for the rain to stop and the, for the rain to come, you know, for the resurrection of the, the widow's son, you know, the tremendous victory he just experienced with all the prophets of Baal and Asherah, when Jezebel makes this threat, like, hey, as far as it depends on me, you know, you're, you're a dead man walking. I'm, I'm coming after you. You know, may the gods deal with me, be, uh, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make you like one of these prophets who you kill. He hears this threat, and regardless of what God had done, like all he, the way he revealed himself and the power that he had and the protection that he had given him, 1 Kings 19.3 ends by saying this, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And so as we work our way through the text, first of all, I want us to try to understand why Elijah responded to Jezebel's threat the way that he did. I, I want us to try to seek understanding. Like why, wh- understanding all that he had done, all that he had experienced, why did he respond the way he did? And the second thing I want to understand is how God responded to Elijah's personal circumstances. Like recognizing uh, Elijah had a specific response, how did God respond to Elijah's circumstances? And so to do that, um, basically I've divided the message into two parts here. Um, first of all, I want to focus on Elijah's response to, to Jezebel's threat. And, and granted, there is no definitive answer in the text, but uh, I do believe from the text that we can see that Elijah goes through a season of depression, and that's very clear. And sometimes in our lives, as we're living, may, maybe we've been on the mountaintop, and, and it, it may be something simple. It, it may, we may not even understand it, but we go from a mountaintop to a valley. Or, or maybe it, we've just been on a plateau for a long time, and gradually we just are moving away from God, and we find ourselves lonely and isolated and depressed. What, whatever it is, you know, in Elijah's case, it was mountaintop to valley, like one threat. It was almost like the threat of Jezebel was the straw that broke his back. I think about like all that he had been through. And he ends up in this serious depression. And so I, I want to look at the text, and there, there are kind of four things I, I want to look at. And, and so as, as we work our way, I want to look at how to get depressed in four easy steps. All right, so if you, if you have a desire to get depressed, I'm going to tell you how to right now. And you can walk out the door and be as depressed as you want to be. Just do these four things, all right? And we see it happen in Elijah's life. Um, So let's, first of all, read the passage, and then we'll talk about it. In 1 Kings 19, 3 through 5, we can read this. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while he himself went a day's journey into the desert, he came to a broomstick and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. He says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All right, so step one in our journey into depression is this. Simply just wear yourself out. Wear yourself out. Think about Elijah and all that he had gone through up to this point. Like he had a three and a half year roller coaster ride. You know, and, and it wasn't easy, and, and he did have the benefit of this, this constant communication, constant leading from God, but, but God was, was challenging him. God was, was leading him to step out of his comfort zone. And when we think about it originally, like the first thing he was called to do was to confront the most powerful person in, in his world. Like, go confront the most powerful person that, that, that you could walk up to. And knowing them to be evil and not God-honoring. You know, sometimes you feel confident approaching someone and, and confronting them because they're a godly person and you're godly and, and, and you just, you want to help them become the best version of themselves. And so sometimes we have to hold people accountable. Sometimes people have to hold you accountable. And, and when it's done in love and people are godly and they're humble, they receive it. It's not, it's not fun. It, it doesn't make you happy. But, but people recognize that it can benefit them. That, that wasn't the case with Elijah confronting King Ahab. As a matter of fact, that whole time after that confrontation, King Ahab sought to have people take Elijah's life. So he was basically a man on the run from, for, for three and a half years. And, and the, the thing about Jezebel's threat, it, w- it was the same threat that he was under for the last three and a half years. 
So he, he confronted King Ahab. You know, he had, he had to pronounce judgment on Israel. That probably was very emotionally challenging for him, um, knowing that, you know, the people of Israel would have to suffer because of their wickedness, because they weren't trusting in God. He had to go into hiding. He had to leave his family and, and his, his surrounding and his, what, what his comfort um, during the drought. He had to live, like, in the desert in the Kareth Ravine. He had to move to Zarephath and live with this widow and being dependent kind of on her, God blessing her so she could bless Elijah. He had to confront 850 prophets by himself. He had to execute jo- God's judgment on the false prophets. And now, after that's taken place, Jezebel's like, hey, you're as good as dead. If it, if it depends on me, you're as good as dead. He's like n- the number one person on Israel's most wanted list. The queen says, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure you're dead as soon as possible. And then in 1 Kings, it tells us that he's afraid, and he begins running for his life. And I think all that's going on in Elijah's life, I can imagine that he's just not physically exhausted. Like physically, like running for his life isn't like jumping on an airplane, or it's not like jumping in your car and driving away. Like he literally was physically running for his life, all right? You know, he didn't have convenience stores that he could pop into to, to get something to eat. He would, he would be dependent on what he could find, or maybe there are some, some people, but he was going to isolated places. He was, he was going into the desert, so there really wasn't that either. I imagine he wasn't just physically exhausted, but, but uh, uh, from everything that happened over the last three and a half years, I, I'm, I imagine there was you know, just mental exha- exhaustion, emotionally exhausted, spiritually exhausted from all the tension and the stress, and the anxiety, and the uncertainty that he faced on a daily basis. And I'm going to ask you, like, in, in times of stress, or busyness, or uncertainty, how often do we find ourselves just feeling worn out and exhausted? I mean, it's, to me, it's, it's like something I feel like I say every other day, like, man, I am so tired. And sometimes it's, it's physical tiredness, but sometimes it's, it's mental. T- like I'm just like thinking and planning and things not happening. I have to rearrange things. And like sometimes it's, it's mental. Sometimes it's emotional. Like just, you know, if you're counseling someone, you're invested in someone, or things don't work out like you, you, you want, and you're disappointed, you're emotionally exhausted. Sometimes it's spiritual. Like you, 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 you know what it's like to be on the mountaintop with God. You, you know what it's like to walk in his presence. You know what it feels like when you're empowered by him. And in times we feel distant from God and maybe we've wandered away. We've taken our eyes off of him and, and we feel it. We sense it and we, we want to go back. And so we're just spiritually exhausted. How often do we find ourselves j- just constantly busy? And no matter how much we plan or how much we organize or how much we work, there always seems to be this long list of obligations that we have to fulfill and expectations that our people are l- looking to us to, to fulfill. And they all need to be accomplished. And so whether it's spiritually or physically or mentally or emotionally, you know, how often do you feel exhausted in your life? Do you want to get depressed? Just continue to wear yourself out. Step two, as we continue looking at the text this morning, the second step on our journey into depression is, is to shut people out, all right? So you can wear yourself out. The second step is shut people out, and that's exactly what Elijah did. In the text, he abandoned his closest friend, his servant. At first, Elijah at least had his servant, and as he's running off into hiding and, and trying to, to run for his life, it, at first he at least had his servant with him. But in First Kings, it tells us when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. And oftentimes we do something very similar in our own lives. When we start feeling overwhelmed when we, or, or we start feeling uh, anxious about things, oftentimes we, we abandon the people that are close to us. We, we begin to build walls around our hearts and around our lives to prevent people from, from you know, getting too close to us. And, and maybe it's because we're trying to protect ourselves from, from their expectations and, and, and their, you know, their desire to, to burden us. But other times we, we build these walls to push people away because we don't want to burden them with, with our, the, the weight of what we're dealing with. And so whether it's to protect us or pr- to protect others, one of the things that we typically do when we start getting anxious or we start feeling overwhelmed and, and depression starts creeping into our lives as we begin to push people away for one reason or another. 
If we want to get depressed, just continue to do that. Continue to shut people out, push them away, and just do life isolated and alone. That's a sure way to, to move towards depression. Step number three in our journey is this, focus on the negative. Just, just focus on the negative. Once again, we see that's exactly what Elijah did in, in the circumstances of his life. Think about what Elijah prayed. He's like, take my life. And then this last section, he's like, I'm no better than my ancestors. Think about that. Like all, all that God had done, God had chosen him to, to be his mouthpiece, to, to show his power to the people of Israel, to, to call them back, to bring judgment upon those who are wicked and leading other people astray. God had, had chosen him, and as he looks at his life, all he can see is his brokenness. All he can see is his, his anxiety. All he can see is his fear. All he can see are the things that he did wrong. And he, and he looks at himself, and he compares himself to these wicked people that God had to, to use him to confront. And he's like, I'm just like them. I'm unfaithful. I'm broken. I'm sinful. I'm, I'm no better than them. And all he can do is focus on the negative in his life. When self-pity begins to take over our minds, our minds begin to create distorted view of ourselves and our circumstances. And I think that's what we see in Elijah's life. Like, he, he's, he's missing the role that he has played in God's kingdom work. He can't see it. All he sees is his brokenness. And, and in our lives, you know, self-pity has this tendency to exaggerate ourselves and our circumstances. And we begin to think things like, you know, I'm never going to be any good. Or no matter, you know, what happens, you know, I'm not going to be happy. Or no one is ever going to love me or appreciate me. Or I'm always going to be stuck in this life. Or my life is never going to change. Or things are never going to get any better. And as long as we continue to focus on the negative in our lives, we will never see God and his role. We will, n we will never see God's plan for us in his kingdom. If you want to get depressed, just focus on the negative. And there's, there's one last step in our, our journey to depression, and that's just forget God. Now think about all the ways that God revealed himself to Elijah, all the, the communication, all the answered prayer, all the supernatural protection and provision, like during the, the drought. Elijah had birds feeding him for crying out loud. Like they brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. Like in, in the middle of a, doubt, a, a drought, God had provided a brook for Elijah to drink from. Then he, he moves into Zarephath, and, and you know this, this woman with nothing, literally nothing, just enough flour and enough oil for one last meal. He's like, go live with her and, and tell her, if she gives you this bread first, everything will be provided. Like, she will never run out of flour, she will never run out of oil, and she will be able to eat through the drought. And God was faithful in so many ways. And after all that, he seems to forget about it. And the only thing he is able to focus on is Jezebel's personal threats. But before we criticize Elijah too much, aren't we guilty of doing the same thing in our lives? I mean, all of us probably can think of times in our lives where, where God has stepped into our lives in some way. And, and maybe it's not pro a profound way like, you know, I've, I've never had a seagull, you know, fly over and drop a Big Mac in my lap, you know. But, but God has stepped into my lives a number of ways. Like in times when I, when I needed this sense of peace, like I was just so anxious and I, and I recognized I can do nothing on my own. I, I couldn't bring, I, I couldn't come to this, this sense of peace. God was able to, just, to, to supernaturally just give me his peace. None of my circumstances changed, all right? Nothing, like the, the things I was worried about, the, the things I was consumed about thinking, nothing had changed. But when, my, and when I shifted from, from thinking about those things to remembering God, Remembering who he was, this sense of peace came over us, well, it came over me. And, and, and at times, you know, God reveals himself in different ways. Sometimes he reveals himself through his word. Sometimes it's through his spirit. Sometimes it's through provision. Sometimes it's through his strength or through his comfort or through his peace. And the list can go on and on. And regardless of how God has provided for you in the past, regardless of how he responds to our need in the past, at times when our circumstances change and we feel, begin to feel anxious and we begin to focus on the negative, 
we, we sometimes forget about God. And so once again, if we want to get depressed, so just follow those four simple steps. You know, wear yourself out, shut people out, focus on the nev- negative, forget about God. I don't want to. I don't want to leave you there, though. All right, and and God doesn't leave us there in First Kings. He continues to talk about Elijah and his experience, and and God doesn't leave Elijah in this place of depression either. We're about two thirds of the way through the message, and and we understand why Elijah might have responded to Jezebel's threat the way he did. You know, maybe maybe he just came. It was just the straw that broke the camel's back. It led him into depression, and and we see these negative habits that he found himself doing. So the, question, the second question I want to answer today is this. How did God respond to Elijah's depression? We've talked about the four easy steps that lead to depression. I also want to look at God's prescription for our depression. Like, what, what does God want to do to help us when we find ourselves in the midst of depression in our lives? First thing is this. I, I see that God strengthens us to deal with the, the, the depression we face. God strengthens us to deal with the depression that we face. And I, I probably said something different because I, uh, I changed my, sorry about that. Can you change that? God strengthens us to the, anyway, write it down if you're taking notes. God strengthens us to deal with the depression that we, that we face. Look at uh, 1 Kings. I didn't change this. In, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah finds himself tired and weak and alone and depressed. And we can read this all at once. Like he, he's, if you remember where we left off, he, he, it's like God just let me die. I'm no better than my ancestors. And he finds his broom tree and he just lays down and goes to sleep. Okay, that's where, that's where we, we left him. In, verse, uh, in chapter 19, we pick back up. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. And apparently that wasn't enough because in verse 7 we can read this. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. He traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. All right. So God sees Elijah. He understands Elijah what he's going through, and he responds to meet Elijah's needs by providing something to eat and, and some encouragement that would strengthen him. And because of God's intervention, we see Elijah can move forward in his kingdom work. Now, when it comes to our lives, God may not make a home-cooked meal for us. We might not wake up and find you know, some bread you know, on our nightstand, but he does understand our needs. And he does respond to our needs. For us, we probably don't need a home-cooked meal. Maybe we need friendship, or we need encouragement, or we need comfort or peace or relief from a financial burden, or we need accountability with dealing with some sort of addiction or problem. Maybe we need strength to confront a serious issue in our lives. Whatever it is, God is faithful in knowing and responding to our needs. The fact of the matter is, it may not be how and when we want it or expect it, but God is faithful in, in meeting those needs in our lives. So as we, as we move forward, you might want to just wait for me, Robin, to say these because it, they may not match what you have. Because <laughs> um, I, I knew it was going to be a long message. I got a minute and 49 seconds left, and I got two more points because I had cut one out. And I combined them. So here we go. Step number two. God speaks in ways we need to hear him. Is that what I had? God speaks in ways we need to hear him. All right, awesome. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 19, 9 through 12, it says this. There he went into a cave and spent the night. All right, so Elijah, uh, where we left him, he was weak, tired, sleeping under a bush. God woke him up, fed him, allowed him to go back to sleep. He woke him up again, fed him again because of God's interaction with him. He's like, hey, go to to uh, the mountain of God, um, which was a 40-day journey. And so he gets up. I'm assuming God provided for him for those 40 days as well. And he finds himself there. Then he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the God, for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars, 
and they put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Right? But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. All right, and it says, when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Not only does God know our situation and our circumstances, not only does God know what we need, we, we also see that in his response, he knows what we need to hear, and he knows how we need to hear it. I, I find it really interesting in this passage, um, thinking about uh, God and his interaction with Elijah. When we think about the history, the three and a half years, like all, and, and just the recent history, the last two months of Elijah's life, how God spoke to Elijah in so many powerful and profound ways. Like, there was no, like, when, when, even when he spoke, it says, you know, Elijah pulls his hood over his face. It's, it's a sign of humility. Like, I, I'm not worthy to, to be seen by you. I'm not worthy to look on you. A sign of humility. And so in the, in the past two months, or if you want to go back, the past three and a half years, God had spoke to Elijah in so many powerful and profound ways. And in this circumstance, like, God was like, hey, I, I'm still this God. I'm, I'm still all-powerful. I'm still capable of, of doing these amazing things, but it wasn't through the, the wind that was strong enough to shatter rocks. I can't even imagine that. The earthquake or the fire. And God has the power to bring those to be, but God appeared to him or spoke to him in this gentle whisper. And so uh, to, to me, that, that just represents the fact that, you know, God is all-powerful, but God is very intimate and personal as well. And, and that is exactly what Elijah needed at the time. He, did, he had experience with, with God and his power and, and the fact that God was totally transcendent and above him. And, and a lot of people have the understanding of God, that God is the creator, he's all powerful, but what we really need at times is, is to know that he is present in our life and he knows us and he loves us. And at this time in Elijah's life, that's what he needed. He, he needed to experience God in this gentle whisper. A very intimate, very personal way. God's able to do the same thing in our lives. He not only knows what we need to hear, but he also n knows what, uh, how we need to hear it. And like I said, at, at times he's able to speak to us in different ways. Sometimes he speaks to us through music. Sometimes it's through creation. Sometimes it's through his word. But sometimes God just speaks to us through this gentle whisper. The question is, are we willing to listen? Are we willing to just, uh, just, just focus on him and, and, and listen for his voice in however way he wants to manifest it? There's one final thing I want to point out this morning, and, and that's uh, God helps us deal with our depression by revealing his purpose for our lives. God reveals his purpose for us. In 1 Kings 19, 15 through 16, we can read this. It said, the Lord said, uh, the Lord said to him, go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel king over Armin, or Ar Aram. Sorry. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from uh, Abel-Mehalah. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. To succeed you as prophet. He's like, hey, Elijah, I, I understand the stress. I understand the weariness. I understand the isolation that you've been feeling but you still have a purpose, and you still have, I still have plans for you. God's able to help Elijah see the, the promises that he's made, the purpose that he had for him, the plan that he has for his life. You know, I, I've had a number of conversations with people who just couldn't come to terms with the fact that God intimately knew them and had a plan and a purpose for their lives. 
And, and maybe they maybe they understood, okay, I, I get God has, I mean, he's, got, he's all-knowing, so obviously he has a purpose and plan, but the, what they struggled with was like God actually wanted them to understand it and know it, and he wanted it to, real, to reveal it to them. In Ephesians chapter 2, 10, Paul writes this. He says, for we are God's handiwork. Just listen to this. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, works which God prepared in advance for us to do. As, as we think about that passage, he's like, hey, you, you were, cre-, Paul is literally saying you were created by God so that you could accomplish the things that, that God had already planned for you to do. Like it, it's our, he, in his mind, it's as good as done because he uniquely prepared you to do these things. And sometimes for us, that, that's like, like going into the community and showing love. Sometimes it's investing in your family. Sometimes it's investing in your spouse. Sometimes, you know, it's investing in your neighbor. Sometimes it's, it's just in humility, serving others or loving others. Sometimes it's generously giving and being hospitable, inviting people into your house. Wh- whatever it is, God has these, he, he's created you uniquely. He's gifted you uniquely. He's empowered you to do what he has planned for you to do. We just have to be faithful enough to, to be willing to step into those things. When it comes to God desiring for us to know what his plans are, I, I love Psalm 32, verse 8. King David records this. And this is, these are God's thoughts that he's trying to establish for people to understand. God, God states, I will instruct you. He's talking about you know, all of us. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Have you, ever, have you ever realized that like God's like, hey, I want to help you know what I want from you, how you can serve me, how you can love others. I, I want to help you see that. And, and, and I'm going to be constantly watching you to encourage you and to open doors for you and to empower you when you need it and encourage you when you need it and give you comfort when you need it and give you boldness when you need it and give you the words when you need words to say, I want to do that for you. That's God's attitude. And so as we come to terms with this reality of God knowing us and having plans for us and wanting it to, re- to re- reveal it to us, I think uh, the praise team can come too. We're going to wrap things up. The, the reality is we, we have this opportunity. Okay, Elijah was confronted. He, he, was, he was overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. And in, in, in the moment that, that we read about in 19, his, his eyes were definitely off of God. Now, like he, he was in the midst of doing God's work, believe me. And I find myself there, like, yeah, you work at a church, you think, hey, you know, how can you, how can you struggle? Like, how can you have spiritual issues when you work at a church? Sometimes you're so consumed with doing the will of God that you don't invest time in, in, in the relationship with God. And I think that's what we find in Elijah's life. Like, he's so busy working for God, that he, he's failing to, to invest in his relationship. And so he, when, he, when he has this threat, the straw that broke the camel's back, he goes into this serious depression, and he's like, it, it's not like, hey, God's provided for me in every other instance of my life. He can provide for me now. He's just so consumed by, you know, what maybe he didn't do. Because he's like, I'm no better than my ancestors. He sees his unfaithfulness. He's like, well, you know, I, I'm no better than them. So what he does when he finds himself weak and alone, focusing on the negative, forgetting about God, and God's like, hey, let me restore you. Let me, let me give you an understanding that you have purpose. I have a plan for you. And, and I think when, when that reality strikes us and we realize that, hey, God knows me and he loves me and he, he has a plan for me, my life has purpose and meaning beyond beyond myself. Like I'm, I'm meant to be a part of something so much bigger. It, it can help move us out of this self-pity that we feel, this depression that we feel be, because we're focused on our circumstances and, and we begin to, to refocus on this loving God who is, who's constantly been providing for us. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from him. So all the good things in our life and he's been blessing us through, through various ways. My hope and prayer is that we can move out of this this season of depression into a deep, meaningful relationship with God, where we can, uh, you know, fulfill His purpose for our lives. So I'm going to ask you to stand with us, and as we close our, our 
our service this morning. And we're going to sing this song. It's by David Crowder. It's a song that just points to God is waiting for us. And, and, we, and wh whatever state we find ourselves in, whether we're happy or sad, depressed or, you know, enthused, um, God's, God 